Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 1. Exodus is a wonderful book. It has, actually I think it's just full of miracles. From chapter 1 all the way to the end, you just see God at work in men's life. When I say men, I mean men and women. And so I would like to request us to read together from verse number 8 to verse number 14. Uh, I will be talking about chapter 50 of Genesis and I will talk about chapter 2 of Exodus as I continue to share the message that the Lord has placed in my heart. But together I would like us to read from verse number 8. Mine is English Standard Version, but you can read from whatever version you have. Amen. Now this, there arose a king, a new king over Egypt. We are reading together. Let's take it up again. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities in Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of reading your word. We thank you because... You are the word and the word is you. There is power in this living word that you have given unto us. Thank you, my father, because you will use the same to meet every need that any of us has. And Lord, you will use your word to bring salvation, healing, and deliverance. I pray that this word will create faith in everyone who shall hear, who shall hear it today and you shall hear it even afterwards. Thank you, Father, for them that are present here and them that are watching us online. I pray that your blessing will reach each and every one of them. Father, I stand under the scriptures and I pray the authority of your word will reach out to every one of us for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Greet your neighbor for me as you sit down. And tell them favor brings good success. <laughs> Amen. This is the best service. Amen. We are just relaxed. There is no hurry. We will finish the service, go to the canteen and have our lunch. And go out and uh, you can even go to Uhuru Park. There is a boat there nowadays. So relax. And please promise me that you will not sleep. <laughs> that is the only challenge of that service. Kindly make sure that you put your finger here and pull your eye. Just in case you feel like sleeping. Because God has a word for us. And I know he will give it to us and give us the blessing. Amen. So favor that brings good success is what we are going to be talking about and I believe God is going to help you to get that favor, to understand that favor, and to operate in that favor. The portion that we have just read is an important uh, portion of scripture. But if you look at chapter number one, the book begins by saying, and these are the names of the sons of Israel. And that is so important for me because in the ancient Hebrew, the book of Exodus was called that. You know, Vale Shemoth, meaning, and these are the names. Shem in Hebrew means name, 
and the final oath means the plural form of name. So these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. And then he begins to list the names of those men. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Those are the names of those sons. And he didn't put the name of Joseph there because Joseph was already in Egypt. God had intended for him to go ahead of his brothers and his father as well so that he can preserve that nation and build up this community of believers and actually give them life. Because we realize that there was famine in the land of Israel where they were gathered at that particular time, where they were dwelling, and they had to go to Egypt because they got word that there was food and, 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 and even food for livestock in Egypt. But remembering the story of Joseph back then, Joseph is this man who was favored by God. And back then, uh, you know, there's a time he had a dream and he dreamt that the brothers were bowing before him. And the brothers became very jealous of him and dis uh, uh, planned to kill him. Uh, but one of them defended Joseph and they ended up selling him to the Ishmaelites. And these Ishmaelites carried Joseph to the land of Egypt. So he never died. But all this was within the plan of God. Praise the name of the Lord. I tell you, God is with you. Even when a deal is being done against your life, he is with you. You may not be present where things are discussed against you, but the Lord is present. Sometimes I find myself saying a prayer and telling the Lord to go to that place where I can't go physically. Because there are people called even witches. I can't go to their camp. But I tell you the Lord is everywhere and he can visit them. And when something is being put in the pipeline, he is there. And he's saying, this is my seed. You will not touch him. So they did a plan. And already when they saw Joseph coming, they had already known what to do with him. But God was there. He spoke through the elder brother. And they said, let us not kill him. Let us sell him out. But all was in the plan of God. As Joseph was being transported to Egypt, I don't know what was going on in his mind. Maybe he's thinking, where, why did they have to sell me? Why do they have to treat me like that? Who have I wronged? I'm just the last born, as it were. Why do they have to treat me like that? Probably he complained in his heart. But do you know that God was in that convoy? <laughs> he was right there. He was going with Joseph to Egypt. And I love this God because... He is a mighty God. When you don't see him, just know he's right there, especially if you are a believer. So they, they sold him and he went ahead and God gave him favor. We will not have the time to talk about the imprisonment and how he suffered in Potiphar's house and all that. But we know that even in Potiphar's house, God was there and he preserved him. When he was taken to the prison, God was there. And he preserved him. So the, the reason was that they needed somebody who will listen to God, receive the instructions of God, and preserve a harvest for a famine that was going to come. That was Joseph in, 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 uh, in Egypt. And here the Bible says, then Joseph died. And all his brothers and all that generation. You can imagine all these people that have been named here died. But the plan of God never died with them. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you, God can give you somebody to walk with. 
But they can only do so much. People will come and people will go. But the plan of God is yes and amen. It can never stop because the person who seemingly was the one leading you or guiding you or supporting you is no more. God will continue to walk with you because his plan is not frustrated by the presence or absence of anything or anyone. Praise the name of the Lord. The greatest theme of the book of Exodus is I am. God is the I am in present form. He is not the God who was. He is the God who is. He is the great I am. He is working with the Israelites. He is there together with them. But the central theme is deliverance and salvation. Because the book is full of stories on how God delivered the people of Israel from the hand of the slavery and, and took them to the land that he had promised to them. The meaning of I am is that God becomes that particular thing to his people at every particular point. Did you hear me? I am means that God becomes that particular thing his people need at every particular point. Meaning that if you need salvation, God is the I am. If you need healing, God is the I am. If you need deliverance, God is the I am. Whatever it is, provision, protection, preservation, providence, God is the I am. So in this chapter that we have read, or even in the book of Exodus, the whole of it, God is the I am who is present in the midst of the suffering of his people. So sometimes you may be going through suffering. It doesn't mean that God is not there with you. It just means that he's working behind the scene. And we are going to see that as we proceed. He is the I am for the Israelites. He is the great I am, the one who is working with them. The one who is overseeing everything that they are going through. The one who is appearing before the enemy and says, you will not touch this one. Favor is that thing that opens a door that nothing else can open. Favor opens a door that education cannot open. I'm not saying that education is bad. Favor opens a door that no man can open for you. Some of us who have been trusting God to get somebody, to usher them to a working environment, I would want to introduce you to the great I am. He is the one who knows the heart of the king. He is the one who knows the place where you need to be planted. He is the God who makes a way for you in that place that you're desiring to go. He is I am. So this chapter that we have just read begins where, um, where Genesis ends. And looking at 26 or 50, Genesis 50, it says, So Joseph died. That's a tragedy. This is the man that has preserved the lives of the Israelites. This is the man that is operating in favor. But now he dies being 110. And I want to encourage somebody at this point. It doesn't matter who your guardian is. They may die. But I tell you, it matters a lot who your God is. Our God is eternal. He was there from before the beginnings. He will be there even after. He is the eternal God. He is the one who has given you the promise. So Joseph dies, but the promise of God doesn't die with him. People continue to do the things that God had intended for them. So chapter number one, uh, after the death of Moses, begins by uh, saying that after death, 
the brothers and, and, and sisters and that generation also died. But the people of Israel, verse number 7, were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied. They grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Can you imagine that? This is the doing of the Lord. That even after the death of a guardian like Joseph was, a provider like Joseph was, the people still multiplied and increased exceedingly in strength. This is what favor can do for you. Praise the name of the Lord. The tragedy is in verse number 8. The death is not a problem because from the beginning people have been dying Others come, they die. In fact, this promise that Joseph is an operating under had been given to his great-great-grandfather, Abraham, before Joseph was born. So it has been there, Abraham dies, Israel, I mean, uh, Isaac dies, Jacob is here, he also dies, and then Joseph is here. So death does not mean that it is the final stage of what the Lord has intended to do for you. So the tragedy was that there arose a new Pharaoh over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That was the tragedy. And let me tell you, church, that many times we forget history. History is very important. History is very important because it takes you back to see where all these things began. The new pharaoh who is coming to power or the new king for this matter who is coming in power, he has no idea about the contribution of Joseph in the lives of the Egyptians. He doesn't know and he doesn't care. And so he comes and he starts getting jealous over what these people are doing and even how they are multiplying. And I tell you that is obvious. Some of you, maybe you're going through a situation where somebody is jealous about you. You get a promotion at work, somebody is ready to kill you. Somebody is planning on how to finish you completely. You are not the first one. It has happened in the past. It is happening in our days. It will continue to happen until Christ comes. But the beauty of this thing is that there is a God. There is a God in heaven who will not allow any jealous person to do anything harmful to you. Praise the name of the Lord. So he arises and he begins to think about these people. He says, behold, the people of Israel are too many. I was asking myself, so what? Pharaoh, what is your problem? If the people are increasing, what is your problem? Because you have made them your slaves. You should be rejoicing that you have more slaves. Don't you think so? Because they are building, they are constructing, they are helping, they are working in Egypt. I don't understand what his problem was. And then he says, they are too mighty for us. Don't you think, in fact, I know, I know some of you, when you are employing people, you want a strong person. If somebody comes and they are weak, you feel this one does not qualify. But when you get a strong person, you want to employ them twice. But this is different from what Pharaoh wanted. He's just getting jealous. These people are too mighty for us. They are multiplying. They are too many. And then he plans to kill them. So in verse number 10, the Bible says, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. Let me tell you, child of God, there is nothing, no, no amount of you being mistreated will change the agenda of God in your life. The devil is sitting at a corner somewhere and making a plan to bring you down, to mishandle you, to mistreat you. Let me tell you, if you are about to resign, don't resign. <laughs> Do not. There, 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 there is an amount of people that is working for you. 
There is a God who is protecting and preserving your life. You do not need to. They will fight you, but they will not get you. Because favor is your name. By the way, you can't kill a favored person. A favored person dies at the time that God has planned for them. But they are not killed by frustration. Do I have a witness in the house? There's a song we sing in my place that the seed of God does not die. You bury it, it germinates. That is the seed of God. You bury it, and let me tell you, the seed of God, when it resurrects, when it grows, it doesn't come alone. So you better not bury it. Otherwise, you will have multiplication in the grave. That is the seed of God. Favor is when God looks at you, when you don't deserve anything. He's not looking for the millionaires in Nairobi to give you an assignment. He's looking at you and saying you are the one who deserves this position. You are the one who is going to qualify to get my people out of this land of slavery and take them to the land of promise. That is what favor does for you. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, I was asking myself, why Egypt? God was powerful enough to take this family from Haran, where Abraham came from, and plant them in the land of Canaan without a problem. Why did he have to trouble himself? And take the people to Egypt and then let them live there 430 years and then remove them there. Miraculously again, through pain and suffering. You remember the Red Sea experience? You remember the Jordan experience? And God is working with his people. I was asking myself, why Egypt? I discovered that God wanted to prepare the people for the promised land. Only two amens. God allowed Egypt to prepare his people for the promised land. Why? Because initially, there were only five people in that family. There was Jacob, there was Rachel, there was Leah, there was Zilpah, and there was Bilhah. Only five people. Those five people were not able to occupy the land of promise. They were not able. There were strong cities in Canaan. That's why they had to conquer this city and occupy. Go to another city, conquer and occupy. As they advanced for conquest. And so, when there were five of them, God visited them. And through that number of people, he multiplied them. And 11 12 sons were born, and a girl was born as well. And these 13 people are not able to turn Canaan upside down. So God needed to prepare his people for the land of promise. And that's why he took them to Egypt. In Egypt, he multiplied them. In Egypt, he strengthened them. In Egypt, he built them up. As he prepared them for the land. And secondly, God was preparing Canaan for the people. Sounds complicated. It's not. God is preparing the people by building them up and multiplying them for the land. And he is also building or preparing Canaan for the people. Because again, God does not rejoice over the destruction of humanity. He never intended for anyone to die. So he gave them time to repent and to turn to him. 430 years, God allowed the Canaanites to change their ways and follow him. And because he refu they refused, he had to destroy. You understand? So it was a way of God giving opportunity to these people to repent. And it was a way of God preparing these people for the land. 
And so going back to our scripture, we are seeing them multiply. Then Pharaoh says, come let us deal with them shrewdly, lest they multiply. And if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh uh, store cities in Python and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, that was my scripture for the day, the more they were oppressed, verse 12, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm just thinking, this Pharaoh is sitting somewhere and devising ways in which he can kill the seed of God. He's thinking these people are multiplying so much. These people are becoming strong. What can we do to afflict them? And he comes with a way. He says, let's, let's employ taskmasters upon them to oppress them so that they stop multiplying. But who is God? Who is God? You can, you, can, you can frustrate a human being, but you cannot frustrate the God in that human being. You can kill the human flesh, but you cannot kill the spiritual man in that person. And therefore, we have hope, church. We are not going to be scared and afraid of people who kill the body, but cannot do anything to the soul of a human being. So the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. I'm imagining a Hebrew woman, very pregnant, about to deliver. And then somebody comes and puts a load on her so that she can abort. So that she can die and the baby dies with her. But this woman just gets the slightest opportunity and pushes the baby out. Probably they came twins. So the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. I tell you, God has got good plans for you. God is a God who preserves that which he has spoken. Amen. The more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. Favor multiplies. Even in the midst of oppression, favor multiplies. Hallelujah. They grew strong. And then Pharaoh is not going to relax. In verse number 13, he says, So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel as slaves. I don't know what you could be going through in your family, in your workplace, wherever you are. But I want to tell you that there is a God who understands. A God who is by your side. A God who is your strong defense. He says, even if you fall, beneath are the everlasting arms of the Lord. He is upholding you and lifting you up. There is nothing the enemy can do for you. We are protected by him. Verse 14 says, and made their lives bitter. But I don't know, you could be going through some bitterness because of your experience, what you're going through. But I tell you that the Lord is watching over your life. He will soon deliver you and give you that which he has promised. So they made their lives bitter. They gave them hard work in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. They were building cities for Pharaoh. They were working with brick and mortar. You can imagine it is hard work for them. But the more they worked, the more they multiplied. Praise the name of the Lord. By the way, even if you are given a lot of work, more than the people in your category, do not worry. The Lord is training your hands. You know Psalm 18? He teaches my hands and my fingers to do warfare. You know, he's... That, that other person feels that they are a boss. Me, I don't do the donkey work. You do the donkey work. Because there will come an assignment that needs hands that have been trained thoroughly for that kind of work. 
Somebody may sit there as a boss. Don't worry about them. You do the donkey work. You get your fingers to war because God is training them. When you catch the Canaanite, they cannot escape. Amen. God was training the people of God in, in Egypt because they are about to go for war in Canaan. And it cannot take a weak person. It needed a person who is properly trained for war. Hallelujah. And so it is working to your good and to your advantage. If you are complaining, begin to praise God. Hallelujah. All things work together for good. To who? Not to the Egyptians. I'm imagining that Egyptian who sits there and commanding a Hebrew, pick that thing, place it where it's supposed to be placed. Let me tell you, when it came to the, the, the river, the, the sea, they couldn't help themselves. They could not. They were not trained for war. All of them drowned there. But the Hebrews were walking in power and in majesty. At night, the Lord was lighting their way by fire so that they can see properly. These are people who have suffered. During the day, he's there with a shadow and telling them, I am here. The great I am is walking with you in a pillar of cloud and even in a fire by night. That is the God that we serve. Do not complain. Especially if you are being mistreated by an Egyptian. It is soon coming to an end. And you will have the last laugh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is preparing a people. Let me tell you as Christians, we must be people of war. God has never settled. Our salvation takes war. War with the enemy. The minute you raise your hand and receive Christ, you have declared war with the enemy. And therefore you need some training. You need muscles to wrestle with kingdoms of darkness. No wonder Paul tells, to the, tells the Corinthians that we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. That is who you are. And powers and rulers of darkness in the high places. And he tells the Ephesians, put on the full armor of God. The helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness. That is what God has called us for. And therefore, if you are a believer, you've not been called to sit. You've been called to wage war with the enemy. And the more you fight, the more powerful you become. Your fighting and your suffering are not going to make you weak. And so sometimes I disagree with some of us pastors who, who keep on promising us that you cannot, you cannot live in suffering. You know, we have to eliminate every suffering. Let me tell you, yes, I do not enjoy suffering. But Mimi, Sipendi, I don't like I don't like, but if I must, I know that the Lord is with me. I know that he's holding me up. I know he's saying, cheer on, because I am here together with you. So they, they, they were frustrated. And the more they did, the more they became many. Verse 15, Pharaoh does not get tired. He sees that these people are still delivering. These people are still having people. You know, they are growing. They are becoming stronger. Then he says, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was Shifra, meaning beauty, and the other was poor, meaning splendor, wonderful women. When you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. The devil knows how to cut off a generation. But God also knows how to preserve a generation. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I was asking myself, when a lady is delivering, 
unless you see the full human being come out and you see the gender, how do you know that it is a man coming out? Don't you think that the devil keeps, keeps us busy doing things that are not practical? <laughs> how do you see a child coming out? You see the head and you kill. How? But you know, the devil keeps us busy doing things that are not there. That things that are not practical. He says when you see it's a boy, kill that child. But if it is a girl, let them live. I want to tell you something. There is nobody who can kill the seed of God. The women, the Bible says they feared God. By the way, during those times, the midwives were not supposed to have children of their own. They were not supposed to have families. But I want to tell you something. When you serve the Lord, when you, when you join the agenda of God, it doesn't matter what law has been in existence. It doesn't matter what rule has been in existence because I see God in the same scripture giving the midwives their own families. I wish I had witnesses. Praise the Lord. So, this, this president who is sitting at State House of Egypt at that particular time and having a meeting with midwives, not doctors, uh, I'm just, you know, when I talk about midwife, you can imagine my age, when midwives used to be midwives. I was telling the church in the morning that I was born in our home. There was no doctor there. There was a certain woman, a midwife, who delivered my mom. And I remember filling in for my birth certificate. The, the, the children, uh, Gen Z, praise God. At least we fill for your uh, birth certificate. Some of us struggled to even get the birth certificate. And so you are told, write the name of the midwife. I imagine that Kamban name of that woman because she had one of the funniest names. I had to change that name and call the, the, the woman Agnes. She was not Agnes at all. It was a funny name. And so, imagine now the president of the Republic of Kenya sitting somewhere with Agnes to tell her about what she should do. That was a very idol king, a very jealous king. And so he calls them again, come to my state house, tell me. We agreed and I passed a law and said every boy must die. What happened? Look at how the women answered. Let me tell you, the, the midwives were wiser than Pharaoh. They didn't answer him directly to deserve killing. They were very wise, they said. Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. No, why, why the comparison? <laughs> For they are vigorous. You remember the hard work that the Israelites were complaining about. They are, they are oppressing us. Kumbe God is building their muscles even to become vigorous as they deliver. And give birth before the midwife comes to them. They were so fast. They were so efficient. So before the midwife comes, the baby is out. That is what they told Pharaoh. They avoided the whole conversation because they would have told Pharaoh. And because of this, we allowed the boys to leave. They didn't go there. They knew that they are risking their lives. They told him, these women are not like our women here. By the time you get to them, the child is out. And Pharaoh is still devising another, another scheme. He thinks, okay, if then that is the case... We are going to drown the boys in the Nile. Let me tell you, child of God, do not sleep. Do not sleep. The devil is not sleeping. He will give you an amount of work to keep you busy the whole day so that you don't pray. And if that doesn't work, he will give people, send people to your office to oppress you. 
so that you get ulcers and die. But the Lord is watching over you. There is no ulcer that comes to you. And then he thinks again and he says, I must, off, I must cut off this generation. He says, Joyce must be the last one. No child shall come from her. And says, kill the children. Again, I can okay, they just poof. They come out running before the midwife come. Keith is my firstborn son. So as you try to imagine how you're going to cut off the generation, Mujama, Ashashuka, Ameenda. That is the God that we serve. And then he says, since now this boy has come out, we are going to take them to the Nile. And that takes me to chapter number two of Exodus. There is a boy there called Moses because he was drawn from water. He was born. And the mother took him to that Nile. You know, sometimes God glorifies us until we are not afraid of what people are afraid of. You, you are saying we take them to the Nile. I will take him there myself because I know my God. You know, the people who know their God, they shall be strong and they shall do exploits. We are not afraid of what other people are afraid of. We take ourselves there because we have known our God and we have believed that he's faithful. She took him there in a basket. She knew how to make the basket. Remember the labor? It was training her fingers to make baskets because God knew that you will have a child that needs to be placed in a basket. God can't give you such a word and you're just there, buried, buried. You know what? Let me tell you, we need to get excited at the things that God does for us. There is favor. Somebody say, Chendi. Say again, Chendi. Others are pronouncing it Chendi. You know, it is called Chendi in Kamba and it is such a favorable word. It means a lot to us. When you say that somebody is going through the Chendi of Jehovah, you know, it means that God is just doing something so special that cannot be given to any other person. It is just you. The guys were favored by God. The Nile looked at Moses and it said, this is not the type that I drown. <laughs> that is Jendi. The Nile lifts their hand and says, I can't drown this one. He's so special. And then the crocodile comes because Nile is known for that and looks at this man that is full of favor and says, I can't drink the blood of this boy. That is the God we serve. Favor that gives good success. Moses never drowned. The waters kept on nursing him and keeping him up there. The crocodile came and offered a bedrock for the basket. The guy was sleeping on top, fearing nothing. I was wondering, how do you deliver a child and for three months you are keeping that child and nobody knows that you have delivered? I think the, the Hebrew boys were not like the African boys who cry until the whole city <laughs> knows that somebody has come. They were so quiet. And by the way, doctors in the house, I, I can see my sister here. Doctors in the house, must the child cry? Because if they don't cry, you shake them, you hold them by the leg, you oppress that child until... Is it a tradition or is it medical? <laughs> but this boy never cried and his lungs were okay. There's that tendy that makes the lungs open up even, even when the midwife doesn't know what to do to the child. That is the God that we serve. And Moses was preserved. He was kept for three months. And then send out. I was wondering, did they have nappies at that time? Where did they hang them? You know, for him to be seen that there is a child who has come. But I tell you, God, God is amazing. He worked a miracle out of Moses. 
And Moses was preserved. Praise the name of the Lord. The boy never died. The crocodile never touched him. The waters never drowned him. He survived and he became a prince in Egypt. That is who you are. In the midst of crocodiles and Niles, in the midst of Pharaoh trying to kill you, in the midst of people trying to oppress you. Let me tell you, even in the place of work, there are people who go to the bosses and they begin to discuss you. Who you, Joyce, on Amwana, if, you know, this Joyce, you know, she's a bad person. You know, we need to deal with her. Let me tell you, God is there. I may not be there. In that meeting, I won't be there. But God is there. And he's saying, in Mbeo, Yangai. It is the seed of God. You kill it, it comes up double. Because when the seed goes down, it doesn't come back alone. In conclusion, I want to say, one day of favor is worth a thousand years of labor. One day of favor can save you from a thousand years of labor. The wickedness of this world we live in can hurt God's people. But it cannot defeat the plan of God. Go through your suffering, but just know God has a plan for you. Go through your tribulation, but remember God has a plan for you. The Exodus was a wonderful experience. They needed to come out from what they knew and what they loved. And they needed to walk to the land of promise. I ask you, if you have been found by the Lord, stop staying in Egypt and enjoying the slavery of Egypt. You need a turn around. You need to change and begin to walk towards the place of freedom, the place of safety, the place that God has prepared for us. Let's rise up on our feet.